G'day everyone and welcome back to Our Paranormal World. In the late 1950s, a series of investigations were carried out by the Society for Psychical Research at a stately English home named Hanath Hall. The case had all of the hallmarks of a classic ghost story, but the SPR still lists it as unlikely to have been hoaxed. It is known as the Fenland Poltergeist. In October 1957, Anthony Wilmot, a journalist with the Wisbeck Standard, heard a rumour about some mysterious goings-on at a house called Hanath Hall. He didn't really care for ghost stories, but the current tenants were Derek Page, a local political candidate, and his wife, Audrey. So he made an appointment to interview them. The family had only arrived in the home two months earlier, and while Derek and Audrey lived with their two young children and Audrey's mother, Rose, it seemed Audrey was the first to experience any of the strange happenings. On that occasion, she was awoken in the early hours of the morning by an insistent and very clear knocking sound, which she thought was coming from just outside her bedroom. Thinking she'd probably imagined it, she rolled over to go back to sleep, only to hear it once again, this time much louder. Derek spent the weekdays away in another city for work and, thinking it was perhaps one of her children or her mother, she sat up in bed and said, Yes? When no reply came, she inquired, Hello? That was met with two answering knocks and, somewhat frightened, Audrey hurriedly turned on the bedside lamp, but no one was there. Hello? She said again, unsure, but this time there was no reply at all. Audrey walked to the door and slowly opened it, peering into the hallway. There was nobody there. Since that night, other family members had heard the knocks, and Audrey was certain that she'd once heard footsteps descending the stairs when she'd been alone in the house. Derek himself had never heard the noises, but he did say that his mother had travelled down from Manchester to stay in the house with them not long after they'd moved in. She slept in the spare bedroom and had experienced a strange set of nightmares where she found herself floating above her sleeping body, looking down at it, while some unseen but malignant force tried to pull her away. In these dreams, she was terrified that if she didn't return to her body, she would never wake up. In another dream, she was trapped under a horse while it kicked violently at her face. After a few days of these nightmares and having heard the noises in the house itself, she cancelled the remainder of her visit and returned home to Manchester. The ladies told the journalist that over the past few weeks, the noises had become more frequent and seemed to be concentrated around one room at the north end of the house. They were currently using that room for storage due to the fact that it was the only room in the house not wired into the electricity of the home, but its size did suggest that it was once used as a bedroom. Wilmot did some journalistic digging and he tracked down the home's current owners. It was owned in the 1800s by a man named Joseph Hanath, giving the home its name, Hanath Hall. In 1899, it was sold to George Williams, who elected to keep the name of the house. Wilmot managed to track down George's grandson, Hugh Williams. The Williams family had lived in the home for over 40 years before renting it to Derek and Audrey, and they were, he said, very familiar with the spooky goings-on in the home. In fact, they referred to the north bedroom as the haunted bedroom, and there was a grim legend attached to that bedroom. Long before the home was wired for electricity, Joseph Hanat's wife had died young, 
and he, stricken with grief, had refused to release her body for burial, electing instead to keep it in an open coffin at the end of their bed. He'd ordered his servants to continue to deliver his wife three meals a day. After six weeks, the putrefying body became too much for the servants to bear, and Joseph was brought to his senses sufficiently to allow his wife to be laid to rest in the garden under a chestnut tree. Hugh Williams said no one had ever been able to sleep in that room, so it was left unwired and used as storage. Intrigued, Wilmot made another visit to the home with a journalist colleague, where they both experienced knocks, temperature drops, and the unexplained smell of sandalwood in the corridor. He then elected to contact the Society for Psychical Research. On November the 17th, Tony Cornell, Alan Gold, David Murray, and Michael Brotherton from the Cambridge University Society for Psychical Research visited the home to investigate. After a brief tour of the house, Tony Cornell suggested a seance with cards displaying the alphabet, numbers, and yes and no positioned around a glass in the middle of the table. The lights were turned off and Alan Gold headed up to the haunted bedroom, which they referred to as Bedroom A. He took a temperature reading, closed the door and positioned himself on the landing. Downstairs, the seance began in earnest, with the glass moving slightly and causing astonished gasps from the family. Upstairs, Alan heard a sudden snap sound, which he was sure came from the direction of the bedroom. He swung his torch around to the bedroom door and saw that it was slightly ajar. Somewhat unsettled, he moved towards the bedroom, stopping only to check that the children were still asleep in their beds. The sounds from downstairs escalated as the glass moved across the table. Shouts of, who's doing that? And it's not me, could be heard. Upstairs, Alan again shuts the door to bedroom A and he found no repeat of the strange snapping sound. He turned off his torch and, as he did, felt a sudden drop in the temperature. Then, from the other end of the hall, he heard the distinct sound of footsteps ascending the stairs. Downstairs, the glass was spelling out the name Hanath and the gathered participants watched in stunned silence. For Alan Gold, the sound of the footsteps became louder and he made his way toward them down the hall. When he got to the top of the stairs, there was no one there. He returned to the living room and the group brought the seance to a close. The group from the SPR discussed their findings and the possibility of the movements of the glass being orchestrated by one of the participants. David and Michael agreed to initiate another seance while Tony and Alan investigated the bedroom. Back in the hallway, Alan checked the thermometer he'd left and found that the temperature had dropped by 10 degrees. The two men sat in the darkened room on mattresses and to keep track of each other, they agreed to ensure that their feet were touching at all times. Before long, they heard three knocks to Alan's left. Shocked, they asked for the knocks to be repeated. Comes the reply. Disbelieving, Alan says, knock once for yes and twice for no. Do you understand? Downstairs, the glass on the table once again spells out words and phrases, confirming the name Hanath. Where are you now? asks Rose. Slowly, the glass began to move and spells out the word Jihana. Everyone looks confused. That's not a word. It must be a mistake. David, however, looked at the rest of the group. Do none of you really know that word? He hesitates to tell them. Jihana is a Hebrew word for a place in Jerusalem where the kings of Judah are said to have sacrificed their children. It is also another name for hell. 
Upstairs, Tony asks the room, are you male? Did you die in the house? Did you die a natural death? After the shock of the Jihana revelation, the participants end the seance and Wilmot and his colleagues decide to call it a night. With the others gone, Michael and David headed up to the bedroom and they're astonished to hear knocks coming from the inside. Alan explains from behind the door that they've been communicating for the past 10 minutes with a female entity claiming to have been murdered in the home in 1906. They ask the pair to check the room below to make sure no one's there making the knocks. Michael and David agree, setting up a strand of cotton tied between two music stands in the hall as a trap in case anyone comes sneaking up the corridor. They find that the family are all still sitting in the living room and no one else can be found in any of the rooms. Back in bedroom A, a loud bang wraps out right next to Tony's head and startled and very unnerved, they both decide to take a break and leave the room. In the corridor though, they ran straight into the string trap that Michael and David had set up in the hallway and alarmed by and recoiling from the clanging of the music stands, they take a couple of steps back towards the bedroom. Then they hear a strange rumbling sound from inside that room and shine the torch inside just in time to see a chair flung through the air and land on the mattress where they'd just been sitting. Momentarily stunned, they enter the room, pick up the chair and place it back on a stack of boxes. Tony and Alan leave the bedroom to confer with Michael and David, who agree to keep an eye on the family, while Tony and Alan return to bedroom A. Stepping back into the bedroom, Tony is shocked to find another chair has been placed on the floor and a cardboard box is now sitting on the mattress. They sit down and they recommence their questioning, only this time they hang on to each other's hands to ensure that they're not the ones making the knocks. In this method, they find that the entity says she died on the 18th of November 1906. Soon, David and Michael want to experience the activity in bedroom A for themselves, and so they all return to the bedroom. After entering, they hear an odd metallic clanging sound and turn to find a large brass toasting fork has been jammed into the lock of the door. No one else is in the room. Tony removes the fork from the lock. It looks brand new. It was never discovered where that fork came from. The four men sit in a circle and join hands and hear some faint rustling sounds which they discuss could be the ivy on the walls outside. Tony isn't convinced by that and listens intently. He later describes feeling as though the darkness in the room was collapsing in on itself and he was being pulled from somewhere far away. The men feel him go completely limp, and then he shouts, go away, go away. He leans forward suddenly and says, sorry, I must have been asleep. When they ask him what's happened, he says, something was attacking me, a horse, I think. All I could see was hooves kicking down at me. For more than an hour after that, the group tried to make contact again, but were unsuccessful. Tony and Alan would return to Hanath Hall 10 times in the following two years and experience varying degrees of similar activity. They were never able to confirm the dates they'd been given in the knocking communication that night. The investigators were able to rule out hoaxing but did consider the theory of underground activity causing the phenomenon, but they concluded that it failed to account for the intelligent responses and the movement of objects in bedroom A. 
Audrey Page, would later report seeing the apparition of a fair-haired boy on two occasions and, over time, activity in the home declined. Derek Page later became Lord Wadden and Audrey passed away in 1979 and Derek remarried. He died in 2005. This case is still on the list of poltergeist cases with the SPR, but it's not considered a true case due to the lack of audio or photographic evidence gathered. But it sure does make a great spooky story, and it is currently for sale. So if you are in the market for a spooky house, Hanath Hall might be a great option. I'm pretty sure that bedroom has power by now. Thank you so much for watching. Please take a moment to subscribe to the channel and set your bell notifications to all so you can be kept up to date with all of the latest paranormal content on this channel. I'll see you next time.